you know, if you were if you're a fishing fan and you watched, oh, I heard that. Okay. Well, if somebody can confirm with me in the notes uh, that we are live right now, I'm going to bring Beth back. Um, if uh, if you're a fan of uh, fish talk, um, you and you tuned in to live with Lenny yesterday. You know this happened on that show too. Um, so sorry about that, folks. Um, stay, thanks for sticking in with with us. Um, the wonders of technology aren't always with us. So anyhow, Beth, what are we talking about today? Anyway, I love this start because we're all about being lighthearted and laughing at ourselves tonight, right? So uh, lessons learned the hard way is what we're talking about. So if you ever made a mistake and you can laugh at yourself and share it, you know, chime in on the on the comments because we want to hear about mistakes and lessons learned and that's what tonight's all about. So um, hey, a little glitch getting started is just fits in with the whole program for tonight. We're not going to take ourselves too seriously. I don't know what the lesson to learn on that one is. It's just, uh... But, Keep trying. <laughs> yeah. Before we introduce our guests, um, I want to uh, thank Mount Gay Rum for sponsoring uh, this edition of the Spin Sheet Happy Hour, like they have in uh, in the past. Um, if you're going uh, into your favorite wine spirits uh, place and you want to pick out a nice rum, well, I think Mount Gay would be a good choice. You'd be helping out Spin Sheet and yourself. Um, okay. So, what do you say we bring on our guests? Yes, let's. All right. Do, do, do. Hey. Oh, hold on. I got, I've got you muted. Okay. Can everybody say hello? Good hey, Chris. afternoon. Okay. Hi, Beth. Oh. Hi, Stephen and Dane. Thanks for being How are here. You? Thanks. Great to meet you. Hey, um, so I'm going to do what I do and I go in the background and all that. Before I do that, though, uh, let's give a little toast, start the happy hour out right. Um, and I'll start with Stephen below me. What are you drinking? I'm drinking a Mount Gay and ginger beer, and uh, it's delicious. Nice. Jay, what you got? I've got the same thing, but in different glass and with a limey and lime. There you All go. around. <laughs> Beth? I've got the Mount Gay Silver with a little uh, soda water in there. Ooh, wow. Nice. I've got a Mount Gay and ginger myself. You can't tell it's in this cup. But anyway, if if you can try and coordinate your glass to the middle, the center of uh, the screen. Uh, Cheers. Come on, and you can do it. Cheers. And right in the corner That's there, like you're clicking glasses. That's uh -oh. There we go. <laughs> um, All right. Um, excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm going to go behind the scenes. Talk to you later. I'll see you later. Well, welcome again, guys. We're thrilled to have you all here. And um, like I said, we're going to have some fun and have some laughs. We're going to talk about mistakes learned uh, and uh, things we learned the hard way, which is sometimes the most impactful, right? Absolutely. Um, but why don't you guys just each take a couple minutes and um, introduce yourselves to all of our viewers and just a little bit of background on um, what kind of boat you have right now and what kind of sailing you do. Jane, do you want to get us started? Yeah, I'm Jane Durden, um, and I sail in Herring Bay with Harrington Harbour Sailing Association. But I came here, as you can probably tell from the accent, from Australia. So I learnt to sail when I was about 10 with my dad. We built a little mirror sailing dinghy, and I raced that when I was a kid. Took a very long time off as I travelled around the world and got back into sailing in Maryland um, a few years back. Bought a San Juan 23 and then decided I needed to um, level up and bought my Beneteau 331. So I, I sell that, I race that, and I also race a friend of mine's boat uh, called Fine Tuned. So sailing's been this amazing release over the last 12 months in particular. Excellent. Well, we're glad to have you here. Thanks, and Steve, go ahead and tell us a little bit about the sailing you do. Uh, well, I got started, I'd, I'd say, late teenage years. A uh, buddy of mine, who a uh, good friend, uh, he had a, a front runner, a little 19-foot front runner, and we went racing uh, on that. He actually invited me for the first time and said, hey, let's go racing. And uh, racing what? And he said, oh, I'll race the sailboat. And I said, you race the sailboat? Okay. 
so I went out and did it. And I always had a fascination with, uh, you know, tall rigs and sailing in the beginning, but uh, I had never known anybody or anything to get into the sport. And uh, so I went with them and got hooked. And we ended up that year, I think, going down to the Midwinter Nationals. And we took second place in, uh, in the front runner class. And I was hooked until, uh, you know, a, a life happened. And I stepped away from, um, from uh, sailing for a number of years until my son was old enough to join Cub Scouts. And we were in Cub Scouts one day. And one of the other leaders was like, I didn't know you sailed. And I was like, I didn't know I still sailed either. But go ahead and want to come racing. It's like it all happened again. I said, sure, I'd love to come racing. And uh, he raced on another guy's boat. And I did that for two years until I got my own. And then uh, it was the about a year and a half ago, towards the fall, I decided to race my own boat, um, you know, and uh, and go from there. And uh, the COVID la last year was supposed to be my first big year racing. I had all these plans. We're going to do all the bait races, all the our club races down at SMSA. We were going to do everything. And then everything got shut down. And I remember, you know, trying just to get out on the water was a challenge and, you know, had to be inventive and, you know, attaching rod holders to the uh, stern pulpit just so we could go fishing. <laughs> so I could get an excuse to go out on the water Very and go sailing. <laughs> we caught fish, by the way. So it, it wasn't a bad thing. I got a crabbing license because you can run a crab pot off your sailboat. Really? Didn't catch any, but had great sail. I almost <laughs> caught a crab pot on my sailboat. <laughs> yeah, <ba -boom. laughs> yeah, luckily it popped off the bottom of the rudder and I was good to go. <laughs> well, that gets us started and let's just jump right in with some ridiculous situations that we found ourselves in and, and got ourselves out of and, um, you know, jump right in. Who wants to start? Jane, uh, I feel like you've got a story to tell. I've got a few stories. Might have been why you asked me to be on tonight. <laughs> so I told you I started sailing with my dad and we used to charter boats. And I'd learned to sail in um, Port Phillip Bay, which is around Melbourne, which is tidal, but not very. And we'd sailed in other areas around Sydney and we were lent a boat for a summer. So I'd gone out with my dad in what's called Western Port Bay, um, which is a little different. And I not really thought about it. And I was a teenager. And so I was like, I've got this sailing business. I've got this whole being on the water business. And um, I decided that I was going to help the family out and take the dinghy that came with the cruising boat and go off and go and get bread and milk and everything on the, uh, on the land. And my dad looked at me like, you got this, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've got this. He's like, any information you want never a good thing when your dad asks you that question <laughs> no no no, dad I've got this and uh so I went off in this little rowing dinghy very proud of myself rode over got the bread got the milk got whatever we needed came back um realized pretty quickly the question that I'd forgotten to ask my dad as I started to row in ever increasingly shallow water and so I remember looking looking at the boat at anchor and looking at the ground and, and looking at the shore and thinking, like, I've got a choice. I can literally walk back that way or I can row really, really fast. And so I had to row faster than the tide was coming down, which was pretty fast. So our tidal range there had to be about hmm, three metres. So what's that? I don't know, more than 10 feet. And um, there's me in this little rowing dinghy, <laughs> rowing, <laughs> rowing, rowing, trying to get back to dad on the boat and um, trying to keep my sense of cool. Like, I got this, dad. I totally got this. And he's just sitting in the cockpit waiting for me going, any information you needed? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> so <laughs> always get the tide, figure out the environment. Don't get stuck aground. <laughs> Yeah, we learned young and that was a while ago. So it's amazing. I love this topic because the things we learn, you know, the hard way are often the lessons that stick with us the longest. Right. So so when I go down to the marina now, I'm the one walking down the slip going, oh, yeah, we're high tide. Yeah, we're low tide. I'm on the boat US and people are like, seriously, what what's your deal with this? I'm like, oh, well, tides can leave you. It can be <laughs> Leave you high and dry, literally. So. <laughs> Absolutely. And, it, you know, great, great information to be aware of those tides. So, Stephen, how about you? You have a, anything you want to start us off with? 
Uh, well, I, I tell you, when I first took uh, acceptance of, of my current boat, uh, um, you know, the, the previous owner and I took the boat from his marina uh, to a local marina where I was going to have it hauled out and, and do the bottom inspection and get it cleaned and ready to take the transient up the bay to where it is now. And uh, after it was all hauled out and put back in the water, you know, I, I had I hadn't driven the boat yet or even steered it or anything. I decided on the way from his place to that place that it might be a nice farewell to, uh, you know, between him and, and his old boat to, to have one more go at it before he's done. So I didn't take the steering wheel all the entire trip. And so after the boat gets in the water, you know, I, I had moved power boats you know, under 20 feet, plenty of times, uh, you know, bigger boats with, with, uh, you know, diesel engines and twin props and all that, but a, a sailboat with a, a folding prop and, uh, that has almost no steerage in reverse until you have flow over the rudder was a new concept to me. And I wasn't yeah. quite figuring that out. And when the dock master there threw me Hello. the keys and said, all right, captain, go ahead. You can park it over there. And I backed out and, uh, couldn't figure out, uh, for the life of me, how to get this boat to, to go in uh, into the slip where I wanted to in very narrow, a very narrow fairway. <laughs> I ended up reaching out and grabbing the pylon and giving a big hug and just hoping I could turn the five ton boat by itself into the slip and then drag it down. Needless Your brand to say, new I, to I, you I, boat too. Yeah, that's needless terrible. to say, I, I, I got it in the slip and then by the time I got done, I was like, well, I'm glad that's done. I'm not going to move it now until I'm ready to leave. But uh, yeah. <laughs> that was always uh, stuck in my mind. It's one of those funny things. It's, you know, the very first time I need to park the boat, I, I got to learn in a hurry with an audience. Yeah, and you know, why don't we talk about that while we're on the topic of docking? I mean, boy, who hasn't had a an exploit in in bringing the boat into the slip? Is there a, Jane, anything that comes to your mind? Or, I know Steve, you've got so, another one. So I've got a trick for getting over that because that's been a fear that I've had always that you know that the docking audience is way more stressful than actually docking. Yeah. So so my choice of that is to I gotta look my, my mechanism is you call up your mates that you know are on the same dock as you and you have them come ready to catch dock lines for you. And it, it cuts down the chatter and it um, gives you someone to catch dock lines, which is which is not bad, but um, it, uh, it it works a treat. Absolutely. Just that friendly face uh, ready to, to receive your line. How about, how about you, Stephen? What have you learned from docking errors? <laughs> so so it, you just made me think about it. Um, for, first uh, season like last year when we finally started to get the chance to racing um, again and uh, I have a full crew on my boat a couple new people who have never been sailed so they're out for the first time and we're coming back in we had a pretty good night I think I, I actually had uh, 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 pulled off a first or second for that night so we were we were on a, on a nice high for the evening come back and then there's another racer on our dock and uh, he had already tied up he's a you know has a faster a fleet boat so he got back to dock a little sooner and all his crew was there and I had raced on his boat before. So I knew everybody and we're coming in and I'm, I'm feeling all cool and confident, you know, just right when things happen is when you feel cool and confident. And all of a sudden, instead of putting the boat in neutral, I go ahead and flip the leather all the way up into drive okay. or reverse. And then all of a sudden cool. I'm backing up in, you know, with the throttle on and we hit the dock and I had a full audience. It was great. And it's like, You've never been more more embarrassed when you accidentally back your own boat in the dock with, uh, you know, full crew on your boat and a full crew of friends you have on another boat. But uh, uh, it's, yeah, I it's, can it's, I can probably top you. Oh, okay. I was going to say it, it's always a it's a fun topic afterwards because then you get to go to the you know to the to the bar or local pub and afterwards and, and talk about uh, you know everyone gets to share their story about how their boat either almost left them at the dock or how they hit the dock or. You know, and you find out quickly that, yeah, you're not the only one. It probably won't be the only time it happens. Exactly. Yeah. And you learn everybody's recovered. There's yep. There yep. So, so, so not going away. I haven't done it yet since then, yet since then. So my problem was not actually, I, I did not have throttle. And so my first ever race in my cruise, in my Beneteau, I went out, it was a long race and so long, and I was so last that I had to call race committee and say, guys, it's my first time ever racing. Can you please stay and have an extra drink as race committee so that you can actually gun me over the over the line and friend of ours in the fleet. So yeah, absolutely no problems. And it was late and dark. 
And so there's, woo, yeah, you know, it's fantastic and I'm over the line. And in Herring Bay, to get back into ours, we've got to come round and come up a channel to then go into Harrington Harbour North. And so Race Committee, who's in the same marina as us, yells at us and turns on his engine and guns it and he and his kids like disappear up the channel <laughs> and I'm feeling good now I've come over the line and I've got sail up and it's a gorgeous night and uh my crew and I are double handing and we come up the the channel into Harrington Harbour North and I get to the channel marker right when you come through the rock breaker and go to turn on my engine and realized that in this long race, and it's now 10 o'clock, so it's been 12 hours, that I've left the fridge on and the okay. lights on and haven't really thought about anything else because I've been worried about race tactics. And so my engine doesn't turn over. And it's okay. Race committee, Jeff Bowen is just ahead of me down the channel and it's going to be fine. So I get on the radio. Oh, no. Jeff's under motor and his radio is probably turned off and he's done because he's done me a favour. He's gone. So I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? Am I going to call CETO and the, the, the CETO of shame and get towed in? Or are we going to do anything else? And it's a beautiful night and the moon is out and the wind is behind us. And so I decide, no, we're going to literally just sort of cruise our way down the channel and figure out what we're going to do, which means calling the other boat in our crew. Shout out to Snack Time. And Snack Time's been in for a while, and the crew of Snack Time's been in for the same amount of time, and they've been partying on the dock further down. So I have to call and say, can you guys come down to the pump-out dock and catch us as we <laughs> come in? I've got no motor. And... Um, Bless them, they do, they come down. But I've got sort of seven fairly inebriated crew members of snack time waiting for me on the dock as we nervously and a lot faster than we really should have come in under sail and have to figure out how to ship everything and, and come to the dock. But no boat was harmed, no person was harmed. We hooked up into the power for Jubilee, one of the boats in our in our um, in our fleet, and uh, twenty minutes later, my engine kicked off, and back I went. So, lessons learned. Do you now have checking the uh, turning off the battery, or you know, switching I, from two bet. to one as part of your leaving the dock routine? I'm paranoid. I'm absolutely paranoid. But um, I have a problem. So, Benito's, you, you can't actually isolate the. I don't know. You can't isolate them the way. So I've had an electrician out there. I've literally today been off. I've got to replace my batteries. I've become a boat electrical um, devotee. I won't say expert at all, but, yeah, I'm checking that. <laughs> I'm the one checking the belt and the alternator ahead of the oil and everything else on the engine um, because, yeah, I do not want to get left behind. And I've double-checked that I've paid for my uh, Boat US towing insurance as well so, yeah, so I, I'm, I am uh, so afraid that would that would ever happen to me especially if I was out cruising or had my my kids or something on board and all of a sudden couldn't start the engine and got in the situation I actually carry a full-size spare battery with me so I have three batteries mm -hmm. on a boat that only needs two and that's lesson learned well, two. yeah well I, I and I have a set of solar panels which wouldn't help you in your situation but being stranded is something that uh, happened to me before and uh, not having any way of charging things up has also happened to me before, not necessarily on the water, but uh, it's yeah. never a fun situation. So, I, you know, having that spare battery to me is, is totally worth the wait. And I'm not mm -hmm. talking about waiting for something. I'm talking about the weight on the boat. That is a really good idea. Thinking I yeah. might have to invest in the third yeah. one. Because it's easy to swap a battery out. It takes seconds. <laughs> yeah. Ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah, that's great. So what about, um, gosh, I was thinking sometimes when we make mistakes, or even if we didn't, something can break. And sometimes that can be a, a nerve wracking situation. Um, but we learn to improvise or, you know, pull something together to, you know, Stephen, do you have any examples of a time where something went wrong and, and broken, but you learned 
from it, figured it out on the spot. So I have I have a great one. Um, and this was in the middle of a, a race. Uh, we go from um, from Solomon's up to the uh, marker, the Chop Tank River and back down. And this happened last year. I had a, a, a wonderful crew who, who joined me for the race and we were racing against uh, uh, the boat I spoke to earlier, Cheetah. And uh, at this point, they had gone all the way up the river or all the way up the bay and rounded the mark. And they were already heading back down before we even got there. So as soon as we rounded the mark, we were, you know, great. We're going to throw the spinnaker up. I'm going to get some spinnaker training in. We're going to all have a chance to do it. And we get the spinnaker all the way up to the top of the mast and the shackle gives out. And all of a sudden, the head of the spinnaker falls down in front of the boat. And everyone's looking at me because I'm, I'm launching the spinnaker because I'm teaching them how to do it. And uh, they're like, what, what, do, what do we do? I was like, well... I don't have a spare halyard yet. And um, who has straws? So <laughs> we ended up uh, rolling the head sail back out because on, on my boat, it was, you know, I have 155% head sail and the main is much smaller. So I put the bigger sail back out and we lowered the main, hooked some, we, we, we drew straws. We didn't really draw straws. We kind of looked around and whoever was the lightest person got to go up the mast. And uh, in the middle of a race sailing down the bay, I sent a good friend of mine um, so kudos to Brian on that. I sent him all the way up top of the mast and, uh, he grabbed the, the halyard and, and we didn't find out until on the way back down that he's definitely afraid of heights. Yeah. So he had a fun time sliding down the mast. And by the time he got to, you know, the spreaders, we were telling him just put his feet down. And I mean, it was maybe a half an inch. He would not let go of the mast. <laughs> <laughs> and so we finally got it down. We got everything hooked back up. We put the spinnaker back up and he's grabbing and, and he, he had a few libations to, to, uh, to, you know, to get the color back in his skin from being uh, so scared. But, you know, that, that was something that stuck out to me was, and that, that's not the first time that's happened. I, you think I would have learned my lesson on that, but it happened again. Uh, we, we lost a, 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 a jib halyard in the middle of screw pile this past year. And in between one of the races, and 20 knots of breeze or so, we, we turned downwind and I sent a guy up the mast to go grab the halyard so we could cross the finish line with all of our sails and everything working like it should. And, you know, kudos to my crew. I, I couldn't have done it without them, but that, that those right there always kind of sticks to me. And now that I'm replacing halyards on the boat, now I'm, I'm going out and I'm buying like really good shackles and really good equipment to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Yeah, mine, mine is always learned invest invest in the equipment, the best equipment you can, right? Yep. So mine, yeah, mine's have good always crew. mechanical. Have good crew. <laughs> okay, Jane, mechan mechanical. Totally, always the the sails and the rest of it all been fine. Um, we cruised, Ian and I was uh, running what we call our race to the raft up. So we run a cruise, but it's a race. It's a very healthy, competitive thing. And we come in, and I got everyone in there got everyone into the anchorage for the night and starting to relax and feeling, you know, everything was fine. I could stop organizing. And I went to go to move my boat to anchor her for the night. We were going to get about 25 knots in Dun Cove on the other side of Knapps Narrows. And um, again, my engine doesn't turn over. This time it's not the battery. And uh, we go and look and I look in the engine bay thinking, I don't know what I'm looking for, but you wouldn't believe that in the bottom of the engine bay is a thing. And I call it a thing because I've got no idea what it is, right? I, there's a bit of something from my engine sitting in the bottom of the engine bay. And uh, lateral thinking, I'm sitting there going, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, I've just done Scott Siegel's course in you know, diesel mechanics and I can do this, I can do this. And number one thing that he says is just work through. So I knew that this thing had fallen off somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm a new boat owner and I'd taken photograph after photograph of everything because my dad had been like, oh, show me the engine. And other people like, oh, show me the inside of the boat. And so I went, Siri, show me photographs of my boat. Well, it threw up all of these pictures that I'd taken, including pictures of the engine, including pictures of where this piece that was a relay clipped back on to my starter to show me where it was. So one photograph and one little turn of electrical tape later and up started the engine. So I'm a huge person about documenting now, right? So somebody tells you something, write it down. Somebody, you know, you get a manual for something, 
stick it somewhere, do something with it, but it's now kind of as much as I can all on my phone because you never know when you're going to need the photograph of the port side of your engine. I love this one because it's so easy with our smartphones to take a picture of what it's supposed to look like when it's correct. Right. <laughs> and it's pretty easy to think, oh, well, this looks great. Of course I'll know what this looks like. And then I, I've heard this story before, you know, a piece on the bottom, where does it go? You've got that picture, you know right away. It was like um, boat Legos. It was a bit crazy, but it was literally, you know, something that could have been devastating sitting in that, in that anchorage was fixed within five minutes. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Steve, do you have manuals that you keep on your boat or, you know, any reference materials like that that you, you have so, in case of, of you know, so problems I keep that you all, don't have to solve? Yeah, I keep all the, the, the paper copies uh, at, at the house, but I do keep digital copies on my cell phone um, in case. And, and my, you know, I have an older boat, so my, my cell phone is uh, my nav, it's all kinds of things, and it's in a battery case so I can charge it, and I also have ports so I can charge it while it's up. So it kind of have, you know, if, if I lose my phone while, while we're out there, it might be detrimental, but I kind of grew up, uh, you know, in the mechanical trade, um, and I can tell you for what she was saying about taking pictures, you know, you might be the best mechanic in the world. If you go take something apart you've never done before and you take pictures all the way to where you get to where your problem is and you take, you know, you go back and look at your pictures all the way back. And believe me, if you got a picture of how it looked before, you can put it back exactly the same way and it worked great. But yeah, I, I keep all my, all my, all those paper copies, you know, on the, uh, on, on shore. Just, it's just easier to have it digitally and I can search it. And, but I'm a big yeah. picture guy too. Yeah, that's a great idea. If you've got to take it apart document each step yep yeah that's that's great that's so a question I thought would be interesting to pop up there yeah sure uh do you guys keep a log yeah absolutely Jane, why don't you take that one first yeah no i keep a log because actually scott siegel when i did the course said that he said Start writing down the stuff because what comes up either in terms of where you've been or what happens can help you to demonstrate a pattern later, which has been fantastic. So with this issue with my battery charging, it's been really interesting. I now write down how does my engine start um, and I write down, you know, things that I've just little things that I notice um, just in case I need it um, as I go through because yeah, after however many sales a year, you're like, when was the last time we did that? I can't remember, but I absolutely keep doing it. I, I, I'm I, really digital, so I thought I would keep mine on my phone, on an app. In fact, I'd love, hello, um, I'd love for someone to come up with a way better app for um, sailing logs, but I've just gone back to the old traditional write it down on your logbook here because it just helps me to think it through. How about you, Steve? Do you have a, a log too? Yeah, I, I keep a log on the boat and I jot things down, but I also try to take that logbook back off the boat and, and d digitize it because yeah. it's a little easier to say and, and my, my chicken scratch can be confusing if I come back to it, you know, a month later and especially if it was after a, a long race or a race where I wrote things down after, uh, you know, we, we did good and I had a few drinks and you know, yeah. what, what was I thinking? What was I doing? It's just easier just to it's fresh on your mind, get it off the paper, get it onto some, type it up, make it look pretty. But yeah. But and, and you and I bought, bought boats from previous owners. I would say if you're buying a boat, the best thing you could actually ask for is a photocopy of their logbook for nothing else that it's got this um, sort of history of the, of the story of your boat, which becomes really useful. Mm -hmm. What bottom paint did they put on exactly? When yep. did they last put it on? What kind of anodes? All that stuff that you just, you don't know. And so I was, one of the most valuable things I got when I got my boat was the prior owner. She was meticulous and photocopied that and gave it to me, which was fantastic. So I, I was blessed because the previous two owners of mine also took really great records and I got to have all that. And the previous owner, um, you know, did a whole refit at some point. And so I, I had, you know, links of this, uh, of all of the, the running rigging and links of the standing rigging. And I had all awesome. the part numbers and, you know, it was really great to have this 
and, and I did this, like I said, I, I digitized everything. I took it and copied it, and, and I have the, 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 the hard copy at home, you know, on the bookshelf, and I keep the digital copy with me. If I have an issue, I can pick up the phone and, and call, you know, if, if I need a Yanmar part, I can call, call the local Daryl and say, hey, I'm looking for part number such and such. You yeah. know, it, it's it's really convenient, especially if I'm on the water and, I, and it's during the day and I can, they have it on the shelf. I can pick it up that afternoon and have it installed and be back on the water. Yeah. That's great advice. And so in addition to me mechanics or, um, you know, steps for starting something or, or turning something on or off, do you all keep, what else do you keep in your log? Do you, how detailed do you keep in terms of races that you do or crew that you have on or just, you know, casual cruises? Do you keep detailed logs of those things? Yeah, I, I try to keep the number of people that are on the boat, the weather, uh, you know, uh, the temperature, just, you know, in case something does happen, you know, it, maybe it's a condition where, you know, something failed because it was too cold or if it was too hot or, um, you know, you know, sometimes it's, it, the failure is just because of uh, lack of experience. You know, uh, you know, when your crew is trying to uh, pull in a spinnaker and you have three of them holding the foot of the spinnaker and all of a sudden it tears all the way across where they're all holding, they all let go at the same time. Um, and then you're in the back of the boat going, well, that's going to cost me some money. Um, and, and you just made that up right now. That didn't really happen. No, right? that happened. That happened. Oh, yeah, that happened. Yeah. So, and and la last year, last year we broke so much stuff on each race. I, I think last year was my my learning curve. I kept talking about, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy new sales, and then something would happen. And then I would fix it. And go, I'm going to buy new sales, and then something would happen, and I would fix it. So so last year's crew shirts was like the rock star style shirts, and it was everything that we broke in the date and the way down fantastic. the back of the shirt. You know, and there were things like, you know, you know, how your snap shackle breaks, you know, up there quote in quotes afterwards. And then, you know, clutch handle becomes personal trophy for the day. So, you know, one of my crew members actually broke the clutch handle off. You know, it, it was just. I try to be silly with it because you, you can't be mad when they're trying hard. And, you know, it goes back to the two weeks ago. We talked about, you know, yelling and stuff and, and being a jerk. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's accidents happen. And that's something that I was taught when I was younger is, is things happen and they're going to happen at the worst possible time. And it's how you handle yourself and how you behave when that does happen. And it kind of your crew feeds off it, too. So. You know, if, if they rip the sail and they look back at you and going, oh, no, I'm never going to be invited back. And you go, OK, put it away. Get the other one up. Let's that's we're still in this race. Let's keep going. And you're just going to owe me some more rum. That's all. You know, they kind of smile and they get back to it. And, you know, they, they apologize later. And you're like, it's OK. You know, you're not the one racing the boat. It's my decision to race the boat. It's my decision to tear my sails. It's my decision to get, put you up on the bow of the boat. You know, don't worry. It's just, you know, please come back and race with me more. You know, it's, it's kind of a give and take. But uh yeah, you, you write, you got to write all that stuff down and, and kind of get conditions and, and figure out, you know, where you can go from there. Mine yeah. is a little more prosaic than yours is, I think, Steve. Um, you and I would be interesting on a boat together, but mine's my, so I don't have a, like most people, my fuel gauge has given up the go. So I've got to track my engine hours to fuel consumption. Mm -hmm. But I'm just looking at it while you're talking about it. It's literally sitting here. And mine is more about like what I notice is, we planned to go here, but we ended up going here. And this is what <laughs> happened. And what was interesting looking back over the year was kind of A, how far we'd been and how varied it had been. But um, Beth, we just sent you that article right about cruising tips. And that was written mainly from looking at my, um, at my logbook, which was nine times out of 10, you plan to go somewhere go somewhere else it's fine the wind is going somewhere else or where we'd been or how many people had been on my boat because that's a, a big thing for me like um helping and teaching other people to sail and so I've sort of just been tracking you know, how many people have been on there how many times have they been on there what have we done where have we been what was what was fun ironically the most enthusiastic entries are sometimes we went out and we anchored in herring bay and had a blast and then came back so <laughs> it's good to watch yeah that's great. So uh, one of the things I, I mentioned we might talk about was um, running aground and, and lessons learned from that. And uh, of course, we all know the saying that if you haven't run aground in the Chesapeake, you haven't been sailing in the Chesapeake. So I, we all have a story to share probably, but we can share our funny stories, but also lessons learned. You know, what did, what did you learn to do? What did you try to get yourself unstuck? What worked? What didn't work? So, um, 
I don't know, Steve, do you have a a story on that yeah. you want to start with? Or Yeah, so so I was going to say, does it have to be on your boat? Um, no, it still <laughs> counts when you're stuck on somebody else's boat. Yeah, so, so <laughs> my, my first time running around, actually, you know, we talked about it earlier before we all started, but my first time I started thinking about it was actually when I was in school, we went on a field trip. And, um, you know, we were, I guess, you know, a part of the, the Save the Bay Foundation. And we went out on like a local fisherman's boat. And so it was the whole class. And on the way in, it was low tide. And Doc that he was trying to bring us to was exceptionally low. And we ran aground. So here is a, a school field trip. I don't know if it was a school field trip or like a daycare field trip. But we had to put on life jackets and get off the boat and swim through the water and climb up the side of the wall. <laughs> And that was the first time running aground. And, and that's so I think true. that's where my fear it. came from of running aground because I've never, knock on wood, I've never run my own boat in the ground. But I've been on other people's boats where we've run aground or at least bumped the ground. And, and you know, we, like we talked about earlier, bumping the ground, it's the first time you bump, everyone kind of looks at each other and what was that? And then it happens again and everyone's eyes get really big and go, uh oh, we know what that was. And so it's an immediate tack and hopefully you can get out of the tack before something happens. And, uh, yeah, I, I've been in that situation and, and luckily it, it didn't last long, but it, it was like, you know, the first race of the season, it was, uh, on a, on a, a guest skipper on another boat. And it was just like, okay, we're not going to talk about that. And of course we, we tell the skipper, the owner of the boat afterwards that it happened. And, it, you know, he's like, well, did you make it? Okay. Yeah, you did. Okay, good. No problem. But it's yeah. like, you know, what, what do you do in that situation? And with my boat, I have a wing keel. So again, I'm, I'm deathly afraid of running that thing under the ground and it acting like a damn fourth anchor and just getting stuck. So I, I avoid the shallows, even if it's uh, like going close to the, to the mark, you know, if, if my alarm starts, go, starts going off, I'm, I'm out of there. I go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've got the alarm as a, as yep, a, I, I have alarm and it's uh, conveniently set at one foot under the keel. Yeah. Very good. Yep. So, so it's, uh, you know, when, when, when I have new guests on the boat and they see that there's uh three feet under the, under the boat and they're like, can we go in this? I thought you draw four feet. It's like, it's, it's okay. We still have two feet to play with before it ye yells at me, you know, uh -huh. but, uh, by the time I, I've had it happen where it yelled at me, um, we were in a race, a very long race up to, uh, Sharps Island. And as we got up to, uh, towards Sharps Island light, um, the wind sort of just died in the middle of the day. And so we ended up drifting. I had every inch of sail out I could possibly put out trying to gather whatever we could to keep moving. And, uh, you know, we're drifting along and I looked down at my phone with the GPS and, you know, I, I use one of those apps on my phone to kind of keep me, it's like ways, but for the, for the water. Mm -hmm. And I looked down and the little blue dot is just kind of like coastly or slowly coasting right over where sharp silent terraforma is. So there's a little piece of green on the map and my little blue dots going right over top of it. And I'm looking around the boat and we're still moving. So I kind of looked at everybody and go, congratulations, everyone. We just sailed over land. I'm like, what? I'm like, yep, don't move. Boat's flat. Just don't move. The current's carrying us, and we're going to be out of the way in a minute. But uh, I think that's probably the closest I've come in my own boat. But, uh, you know, it was a very stressful day until the wind filled in. But uh, we, we stayed in the shallows dodging crab pots on, on the eastern side of the bay, and it was, uh, it was stressful. Yeah. Jane, well. how about you? So I've had the luxury of... It can be stressful, that's for sure. It, it can be stressful. And I had the uh, had the luxury of sailing in... I used to own a San Juan 23 with a shoal keel, which perfect boat for the bay because it literally draws a foot and a bit with the keel pulled up. And so, you know, I'm the person that will sail over. I didn't even realise we had a shoal outside Harrington Harbour North because I didn't draw much. Yeah. But... Uh, notorious from our sailing area is Poplar Island and Poplar Island has you know, been the reclaimed island across from Deal and um, it's got really interesting channels that don't need to be dredged but move and shift and so it's sort of notorious for for running aground and uh, I was very luckily sailing with very good friends of mine Jason and Amy Fox on their brand new just bought Beneteau 38.1, and we decided that we would circumnavigate Poplar Island, which we did, and, you know, gallivantly sort of came up the other side and were fine, and I was at the wheel as we took the last mark 
The last mark is just before you come into the Naps Narrows channel. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, the mark is a little further inshore than where the actual channel is, as we found out. So Jason, the owner of the boat, was down below. Amy was sitting with me in the cockpit and we had a non-sailor also on the boat and we came in, Jason saying, don't take the mark too close. And I said, no, we're good. Bump. Oh. And I immediately said, ready about, Amy? And she said, yes. And we tacked. And we tacked to your point, Steve. I think I'm good. And we bumped again. And so, I, I mean, it was, it was a terrible feeling, but we literally, as you said before, bumped the beautiful bottom of the Beneteau keel on the sandy, muddy bottom of the eastern shore and and I think we were fine. I've been forgiven. I've been allowed to sail on the boat again, but, um, yeah, don't take those marks quite as close anymore. That's a good lesson learned, <laughs> as is the fact that, you know, um, you've probably sailed with them again, right? And yeah. gosh, that momentary panic oh, God. you feel that bump it doesn't last right <laughs> <laughs> it could have been way worse we've got a boat that um, is in our sailing fleet that's a big uh, Beneteau first and she notoriously gets stuck in our not well dredged enough channel and so that ends up with the entire crew out on the boom across there and so I sort of knew generally what we'd have to do but was very thankful that we didn't have to do it with me behind the wheel yeah, for sure. So I noticed one of the questions we had was about dragging anchor. Um, and I don't know if either of you have had that experience. And I mean, again, the war stories are great. We love to tell them. But if you have dragged your anchor, um, what did you learn from it? And uh, what do you do differently? So I, I, I have... Uh... I've dragged anchor before, not on my boat, but uh, we were out just fishing and decided to drag, you know, to, to put the anchor out so we can stay in one spot and jig with the kids. And it ended up, uh, you know, I guess the current was too much where we were, but we ended up almost on shore not knowing it because we're, you know, we're pulling fish up and we're having fun. We're taking the fish off the kids hooks and putting more back on and reworming them and having a great time. And uh, we thought we were okay. And, uh, you know, fr from then, you know, it's, it's been in the back of your head, you know, what do you do if your anchor starts to go? Well, two years ago, before we started actually racing the boat, um, you know, I, I decided that, you know, the family needed a, an, an outing. So we were going to sail from Solomon's all the way up to Chesapeake Bay. And I say all the way up because it, we were sailing upwind the whole way to Harrington Harbor South grab some dinner. Yeah, we were all, should have known you then. We could have yes. hung out. But uh, I, I, had, I had, you know, my wife and, and the kids on board, and I have this great picture of my daughter. This is a tangent, but a great picture of my daughter standing down below where they're leaning her hand against the mask, eating an apple with her legs crossed, standing up. Like there's nothing going on in the whole world. And we were literally beating into every wave all the way up the bay. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, God bless her. My, my, my wife was sick the whole time, with motion sickness. And my son was up top with me and he's my, he's my, you know, number one go-to mate on the boat at all times. So he was helping me with everything, but, uh, we got all the way up there. And as soon as we pulled into the Marina, we tied off, we went in and got some dinner. And then, you know, my wife called her friend and said, please come rescue me. So she made a one-way trip up to Harrington Harbor South and, uh, my son and I spent the night just outside the uh, just outside the marina there in that little alcove area. Yeah, and, um, you know, it's yeah. very muddy, so I was very concerned. I know I had an extra road, and anybody knows stuff about anchors. It's not the anchor that holds it to the ground. It's the chain. The chain, the anchor just holds the chain. But it was blowing hard that night, and I didn't sleep very good. I mm -hmm. think I woke up every couple hours, and I had my map zoomed all the way in, my phone right next to me, and, and I was checking – to see if that waypoint was going to move. And of course, when you zoom all the way in in a map, you know, you're going to see you're, you're moving all around until you zoom out and realize, no, you're not moving at all. <laughs> so af af after a, a wonderful uh, a sleep this night, uh, you know, you, you find all the stuff that moves in your boat when that happens because it's quiet, you know, especially when you think you, you're hearing something up top and it ends up being a, like a can of Lysol that's rolling around in the, in the, in the, in the head you know, inside the cabin, just bouncing back and forth. You're like, what is loose up style? Am I coming untied? What is going on? You crawl around the boat in the dark with a flashlight and you can't find it. 
it, it was a fun experience. And then, you know, my, my son slept like a, like a, like an angel next morning, <laughs> we get up early in the morning, you know, before the sun rises and, and we head back down because he had a baseball game that afternoon and we had to get all the way back home before we had to go to the baseball game. But uh, that was, you know, we didn't, we didn't drag anchor and I was thankful of that, but it was a sleepless night. Yeah. It'd be good. So I've, I've had the, I've never dragged myself, um, but I've had the impact of somebody else dragging. So we're on a family trip up in the pit water, which is north of Sydney Harbour. And um, a lot of tidal current coming between little islands and things like that. And we had a boat completely drag anchor and drag into us. And I remember watching a very large sailboat careening towards us and taking out part of the tow rail and part of the side of the boat of somebody else's boat that we were using. And that's what makes me think there are a few things that I do when I'm anchoring. Number one, my previous owner put what I considered at the time to be an oversized anchor on my 331. I'm keeping it. I love that thing. It's beautiful. Um, I also, when I redid the, to your point, Steve, exactly, when I did the anchor chain and road, I put proportionately more chain down, even though we're in the Chesapeake and even though it's mud and all the rest of it on the bottom because it's just that sitting there. And if you go back and look at it, I mean, I think the number one problem that people had is just not putting out enough scope. Yep. You know, seven to one, that's it. So I don't care where we are and I don't care how busy it is. I'll go anchor somewhere else, but you know, put out the right amount of scope um, and, and you'll be okay. Interestingly enough, Steve, um, to get a little environmental, they're about to put a new uh, oyster bed right where you were anchored. Okay. And it's been interesting because we've all been talking about, you know, what the impact to sailing might be and, and how much that's going to force people to actually therefore have to anchor closer together in Fairhaven and what that might do. You know, sort of all things to think about as the bay gets busier and more and more activities happening. I love some oysters, but um, it's it's you know right there where that activity is happening. And and one of the things we've been thinking about is is it going to cause people to make um, sort of shortcuts on the way that they anchor right there in Fairhaven, which is not good holding at the best of times. No. So. Yeah. Good to know. Well, we're we're. We've got, you know, we've got plenty of time left, but we are getting closer to the top of the hour. So one thing I just wanted to make sure I gave you each a chance to talk about is just the value of hands-on learning. Like we've told a lot of war stories and we've laughed at ourselves about some mistakes we've made along the way. And, you know, the one way you can make sure none of this ever happens to you is never leave the slip, right? So um, <laughs> I think that, I think Jane, I think you're the one who's talked to me in the past about just the importance of the hands-on learning and the learning by doing. And yeah. maybe both of you could take a couple minutes to just um, encourage new sailors who might be a little timid about that kind of thing to, to give it a go. Absolutely. So look, I'd always sailed with my dad or I'd sailed with somebody else on the boat and it was a big move for me early in January 2020 to buy my boat by myself. And um, I, yeah, absolutely. One of the biggest mistakes that I've made is not just going out and doing more. And so mm -hmm. I'd encourage people that the not doing is worse than the doing it and screwing it up. So you, you will, don't hit too many things too hard and you're going to be okay. But you'll be less okay if you just go, don't go out there and go and do it. So, you know, it's ironic. I think the last time we spoke, I talked about, you know, how, how nervous I was to dock my boat. I bought my boat from Delsaville to Harrington Harbour North in one day. And the last two hours coming into Harrington North, I'm like, oh, my God, I have to, I have to bring it into the slip. I brought it 16 hours up the Chesapeake and I'm worried about, I'm worried about the dock. Um, I think... Also, too, just plain doing everything, right? So now I, I skip on my boat all the time and I bring other people on, but I've noticed that what I'm not doing is I'm always the one on the helm. Um, and so yesterday I took a friend of mine out, Kristen, gorgeous night, great wind. We had 29 apparent. It was pretty, pretty brisk. Um, and, you know, getting her to do moving the jib cars and getting her to go and do things, not feeling like I had to do it and treat her as a passenger, letting her go and do it. But when we came back in, it just sort of made me realise too that 
one of my aims this year is to get me out of my I don't have to be the skipper all the time so my boyfriend and I have sailed a lot together um, and just last week um, he was like I'm going to bring the boat into the slip is that okay yeah so first of all I'm like oh you're going to skip him oh do you know what you're doing but then I realized that I don't know what he does with the line handling when he comes in and um, when we put up my um, my Jenica he's been the one that's quite often raised it and I'm really good at handling it which is great but we've got to flip around and we've got to try it so this year is the year of switching up switching everyone up getting everyone to do a little bit of everything because it's good for you and you you learn and everyone can learn can learn something something new but at the end of the day just try it go and do it the worst that can happen hopefully is you'll round up and Go around in a circle and have people looking at you like you're crazy and that is just fine well said Stephen. what are you what are, what are your thoughts on that that well, hands-on learning and the importance of it i, I i'll say there's a, there's a few things and, and and i'll start with a story before i get into what i was going to say but she was talking about uh, uh rounding up and the, when i was delivering my boat uh you know from from tall timbers up the bay uh, one of the good friends of mine, actually the same guy who said, Hey, come race with us. You know, the first, the second time around and got me back into it. Uh, he, I, I coaxed him into crewing for me cause, uh, you know, I needed somebody else who, who really knew how to sail. And, um, you know, I, I had asked my grandfather to come. He's not really a sailor, but he's been on the water his whole life. So he knows his way around the water, around the boat. Um, you know, he's also a Coast Guard auxiliarist and another one of my good friends, Brian, who came up with, um, you know, we got about two thirds of the way and they go, let's put the spinnaker up. And, you know, I just parked this thing a couple of days ago for the first time. I didn't know, you know, I know there's a spinnaker downstairs in one of the bags. So it says, sure, you go find the spinnaker and all the sheets and everything you need. You can set it up and just go ahead. Go ahead. So we got it all set up and we gave the working sheet to the guy who, uh, who who's never, you know, he hasn't sailed since he was, uh, you know, eight years old. And said, here, you're, you're going to run the spinnaker, a big poofy sail, and we're going to go, we're going to start reaching up the river. And I'm thinking, okay, this is, we're doing great. And all of a sudden, we're, you know, we're powering up and the boat's healing a little more and we're moving faster. And this is feeling exhilarating. And all of a sudden, I noticed that my helm doesn't come over anymore because my rudder's coming out of the water. And I look back and I'm like, ease the sheet. You know, I'm looking for, look back at the rudder, look back at front. I'm telling, ease the sheet. And he, and he does this, this, the same thing that I think every new, trimmer does is they let the sheet out like three inches <laughs> no, no 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 let it go you know mm -hmm. like what do you mean let it go and of course we round, right as i said that it rounded up and my other buddy who who got all the sales up you know he was watching me the whole time he just starts laughing as hard as he can and he says your eyes were this big i was like yep i get it now when i'm not when i'm not uh, the person behind the helm and the helmsman is telling me to let it go let it go and uh that was a big lesson for me and uh, it, it was just one of the, you know, going back to you know, things that you mess up that you, you don't know that you're going to mess up because you've never done that job. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, nowadays I, I talk about terminology. So I try to always invite people out on the boat and see if I can get people out to come out with me. Not necessarily because I'm always hunting crew down, but uh, more so that, uh, you know, when I was younger, I, I didn't know anybody in sailing or anybody with a boat. So it was hard for me to to get into the scene without having a, an open door. Yeah. So I ask everybody I meet, Hey, want to go sailing? It's kind of uh, it might be obnoxious at times, especially if, if like you're my wife or kids, like always asking somebody else. But uh, you know, when I get on the boat, mixed terminology. So if, if I'm, you know, if I'm asking somebody, Hey, let's, let's move to, to uh, can I get somebody to lured? You know, they're going to look at me like, what's that mean? It's like, I want you to go to the starboard side of the boat. What's that mean? I want you to go over there. Oh, okay. You know, and and yeah. and I might at times say, okay, we're going to do this or do that, and have to remember that I have somebody new on the boat that they might not know what that is. So instead of calling for the spin halyard, I'm going to say, okay, we're going to pull that black line in. And mm -hmm. thankfully, everything's not necessarily color coordinated, but it's all different colors, so it's easy for somebody who's never been on the boat to do it. And uh, you know, that that's just one thing. It's just the terminology, and and people they pick that up as they go, and that's something that I've picked up. As I go, you know, when I first started doing this, I didn't, somebody would say, oh, you know, you know, the boat to windward, you're look, looking at the rules of, of the road, you know, okay, we're racing, you know, the boat to windward has, has the, you know, the mark room, 
and uh, you know what's what's windward. Um, you know, I'm the guy in the back of the class. Like, I, I guess I'll figure it out as I go. And then you kind of have to do your own research. But you know, that was years ago. And trying to teach the little lessons each time you go out is it seems to to help me. It helps the others. It helps people coming back. They feel like they are part of the team. They feel like they're learning. Um, a lot of times after the race, I like to give the helm to somebody. If I think they did a really good job, I'm like, all right, you're going to take the boat back in. And they look at me like, well, I'm going to take the boat back. You're going to take the boat back in until a certain point, and then I'll take it back over. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it also gives me a time to break or to, to take a break and talk with everybody and go around and, 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 and have fun and sit on the rail and, and goof off with, yeah. uh, you know, some of the crew. But it's, it's good to give them that opportunity because because they, they sometimes they feel like they're doing really, really good. And then you put them on the helm. They're like, oh, it's not my boat. What do I do? I'm, you know, you can see the fear in their eyes. You're like, you're doing fine. Just keep between the green and the red. You're good. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 a, it's a fun time, I, I would say. And, and if, if anybody is interested in getting in sailing or you know somebody that's not into sailing and, and you think they might be, just have them come out. And if you yeah. think you might be into sailing and you don't know anybody, just show up at the dock. Just find a dock and, you know, Wednesdays or Thursdays, I think almost anywhere up Chesapeake Bay. And you can find a club or, uh, you know, anybody that wants to go out. And I don't know anybody that would, if you showed up at the dock, say, hey, can I, can I come out with you for a couple hours and learn something? They said, sure. They, they bring you out. Especially if you show up with a case of beer or a bottle of rum, it'd be easy to go. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's one thing that I know you do both have in common is inviting guests on your boat. I know that's a really important to you too, Jane, is um, yeah. bringing guests on, especially people who don't, you know, ha don't have a lot of experience sailing and giving them a chance to try. Yeah, well, my biggest thing is bringing on women, particularly who have never, who might feel quite challenged or maybe a little threatened by the double whammy of not knowing a boat and working on a man's boat. And so, yeah, I'm sort of starting up my 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 Wednesday ladies ladies night. Um, last night we went out and we'll do it again next week in preparation for it. We've got a women's regatta um, that we run for Harrington Harbour. Um, sailing Association will be on June 29th and up in Harrington Harbour. And the idea is, yeah, just get everyone trying it and doing it. Don't need to win, but it'd be great if you do. And um, you can learn a lot as you go along. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So I guess, you know, what, and as we're getting ready to close, what do you think is something that would surprise uh, someone who would be new to coming out and sailing um, about about just being on the water. It's amazing and it feels fantastic. Um, I think the thing that surprises people when they're on my boat is that I'm I'm constantly learning too. So there are things, it's not as if I know how everything works perfectly. Last night I was fiddling around with the jib cars and how it impacted sail trim and things and, you know, you can always learn something, you can always figure it out, but that, feeling of being under sail and the quiet mm. whooshing through the water nothing beats that steve do you yeah oh hey guys <laughs> sorry i'm the guy that has to say hey last call uh, <laughs> uh this was great i think we could probably go on forever um, these sorts of tales. Um, this was really great. You guys had, you know, great insights and great stories to share. Yeah, I, I can tell from uh, the audience's comments as well that everybody else has a good story to tell. Uh, yeah. But um, thank you guys for coming on, and uh, I thought this was uh, a lot of fun. And um, oh, hold on, I don't want to lose this thing again. Uh, <laughs> So I'm gonna throw you guys into the green room while I just take care of some business. So stick around for the party in the green room. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Beth. Thanks thank so you. much. Great having you. All right, everybody. I wanna thank you guys for tuning in. And again, another special thanks to Mount Gay Rum. Uh, without their support, we can't do this. So uh, we'll have another spin sheet happy hour uh, next week. So tune in.